When I left Kenya, my mother gave me this big packet full of family documents for safekeeping. And I must have examined these things a thousand times trying to figure out our story. For example, my father's passport shows that just two weeks before Hitler invaded Poland in 1939, in September 1939, he was traveling. He went to Switzerland, here on the border of Switzerland and Germany. Here he's in France. Was he a spy? Was he a partisan? Was he arranging money for other Jews, escape routes? And then there are my mother's birth certificates. This one here shows that uh, she was born in a place called Chernauti. And this one here shows that she was born in Vienna. And then there's this fake document which makes my parents Catholics. I've lived a series of lies. For instance, this one, which is a very well documented lie. And then I found this newspaper article called The Last Jews of Radauti, which is from the Jerusalem Post of 1978. This is the town Radauts, where my grandmother grew up. So for all these years, I've been on this journey trying to figure out what these documents really mean. Turkish, Hebrew, Polish, French, Latin, Romanian, English, German. These papers have renamed my parents, told them who to be, what to believe, where to live and how to live, and have sometimes meant the difference between life and death. Now, they fall like leaves in the autumn of my life, causing wide ripples in an infinite pond. This is how life began for me. An African landscape, a broad sky arcing over my head, a place of no boundaries. Here, I felt very much in tune with the rhythms of the land, Maasai land in Kenya, where their cattle roamed with ours over the plains of Athi. <coughs> I was born on May 1st, 1946, International Workers' Day, a date carefully planned by my Jewish socialist parents, who arrived as refugees in 1942. This is Erica, my mother, red-haired, blue-eyed, long-legged. She believed she had gypsy blood, but she was really bourgeois and grew up in Bucharest, 
where she studied architecture. Ever since I was a little girl, I decided that one day I would come to Africa and look at what was in all the places that were white on the atlas and marked as unknown territory. This is my father, Igor. I was a rebel to a regime. I was kicked out. I ran away for years from Poland. He was a small man with lizard eyes and leathery skin, a Polish Jew, a poser for a photograph, and a pacifist who never shot a gun in his life. But they must have wondered if they had landed from the frying pan into the fire. In 1935, Mussolini had attacked Abyssinia. As a British colony, Kenya was compelled to support the Allies and became the holding ground for troops from the entire Commonwealth. When Hitler believed that the empire was degenerate and would not hold together, this war has proved the solidarity and brotherhood of the British Commonwealth of Nations. It has also shown a united Africa. In Kenya, many non-allied Jews were interred in detention camps in the bush. In this climate, my parents kept quiet about being Jewish refugees. Fascism already had its claws in East Africa. How soon before anti-Semitism would follow? In 1903, the British government had offered Zionist Jews land in northwestern Kenya as a refuge from the Russian pogroms. Although the plan was violently opposed by anti-Semitic British settlers, some Jewish settlers did arrive and became the core of the tiny Jewish community that still thrives in Kenya today. How would Erika and Igor fit into the complex society of Kenya colony in the 1940s. Kenya was inhabited by over 50 ethnic groups, speaking as many languages. Swahili Muslims lived along the thousand miles of coastline. And in the early 19th century, thousands of Indians had been imported to build the railway from the coast to Uganda. And in the 1920s, the highlands west of Mount Kenya had been settled by extremely wealthy British aristocrats who came to be known as the Happy Valley set for their decadent ways. Other British settlers lived solid lives as farmers and businessmen. My parents had nothing in common with any of these groups. Without allies or friends, without religious or racial affiliations, Igor and Erika had to forge their own path. Pa was a veterinarian and parasitologist. His first job was as a meat inspector at a factory where they made corned beef for the British Army. Our farm lay right across the road. The train from Nairobi to Mombasa passed right through it, often carrying troops to the warships at the coast. And so we lived here on our farm in Africa, among the Maasai. Other staff here, being British, didn't fraternize with you. We didn't, we were bloody foreigners. So this was our kitchen. This was the children's room. This was Papa's bedroom. This was my room. You had separate rooms? Always. We had a sitting room to which we brought Mama. And when she came here, she said, how can you tell me that you're doing well? You have no carpets, you have no crystal. What is this? Mm. 
I said, it took about 20 years before we became just foreigners, not bloody foreigners. First came my sister, Rodia, nicknamed Puku, then myself, known as Iki, and lastly, our little brother, Oscar. No nickname for him. If you should meet an elephant upon a summer's day, what would you do? What would you say? The Great Plains lay right outside our door. I roamed around fearlessly by day, but as night descended, I ran for safety indoors. The rainwater tank seemed vast, a place of hidden mystery. This tank, I used to be in awe of it, it was so big. At the factory, Pa had shown me microscopic parasites. I discovered an invisible world pulsing beneath the shadows of our everyday lives. And so I learned that things are not always as they seem. Nearby was a lush grove of papaya, where I hid lost in fantasy. Once upon a time, there lived a king and a queen haunted by spirits. I could be anything I wanted to be, and spent long hours just watching, letting time slip through my fingers. I found Stone Age arrowheads there, and placed my fingers where other hands had held them so long ago. Who had left them here for me to find? Ma said that ancient paths crossed our land, where people thousands of years ago had wandered, looking for better places to live. But try as I might, I could find no traces of those paths. And not far from our farm ran the equator, that magic line that divided north from south. You could straddle it with one foot in each hemisphere. The very thought made my mind spin. In which hemisphere did I belong? Who might I have been if my parents hadn't been forced to leave Europe? And how come my Maasai friends could name their cattle for so many generations back, but I couldn't name my own grandfather? It was all a great mystery. By 1952, I was six years old. Pa had joined the Kenya Veterinary Services and Ma was employed by the government town planning department. So we moved to Nairobi. Now my parents were no longer independent farmers, but salaried workers for the British government. In Nairobi, Nairobi, capital of Kenya, it is our fate to welcome the royal visitors. Warlike Maasai chiefs and warriors with lion's mane headdress, from lions they've hunted and killed with spears, assemble to do honor to the king's daughter. And then the princess, followed by the Duke of Edinburgh, steps, as it were, from the chills of London to the warm sun of East Africa and another world. In 1952, Princess Elizabeth was in Kenya with Prince Philip when her father, King George VI, died. And overnight, she became Queen of the United Kingdom and all its territories. And I waved my flag along with everybody else and celebrated being a subject of the British Empire. I never questioned whether Africans and Asians really loved the Queen. The same Queen to whom my parents had pledged their allegiance in 1948 in order to become her loyal subjects. And so I made her my queen and treasured the plastic coronation mug I was given. There would never have been any Kenya if there hadn't been settlers. 
tough enough to endure the first awful years. They have given Kenya their youth, knowing that they could make nothing of it in their short lifespan. But they were building a future for their children and their children's children. The thing that bound, I think, people together in those days was this extraordinary sense we all had that we were creating something. The sense of making a country, placing it under British traditions and ideas. For decades, the British had systematically confiscated African land and reassigned it to settlers, ignoring African demands for equal rights and fair representation. But now, the Kikuyu people began to agitate for return of their land and freedom from white rule. The empire was beginning to crumble. In Nairobi, capital of Kenya, Europeans and Africans still walk the streets in fear of a dreaded Mau Mau. For it is that band of fanatics whose bloody deeds have cast a dark shadow across the face of Kenya. I take this oath to fight for our land and freedom against the white man. We were told that the Mau Mau were savages who fornicated with goats and drank the blood of human beings. They buried white farmers alive and slashed the legs of their cattle. Some of this was true, some was not. I never saw a Mau Mau, but my dreams were filled with witchcraft and bloody oaths. There may be Mau Mau on your farms, in your cities, in your homes. I feared our dear Kikuyu cook. Was he one of them? I've just arrived from Kenya, where for over six months we've been in the throes of a battle against Mau Mau which is really another name for a struggle against the destruction of civilization and law and order and everything that we hold of value. Everything that we held of value, what was that? Like other white men, Pa was ordered to patrol our street with a gun, but it was unloaded. He told me that he would never kill, not even a Mau Mau, and that we had nothing to fear, for Africa was our home where we belonged. One of our great friends was a British district officer instrumental in quelling the Mau Mau uprising. Detribalised Irish out of the Irish potato famine across England, uh, sent uh, indentured to the Southern Indian railways, and then um, upward social mobility. You weren't quite gentlemen, you weren't quite natives. Today, over 50 years later, Former Kikuyu freedom fighters accuse our friend, among others, of having overseen Nazi-like atrocities in the Mau Mau detention camps called Kenya's Gulag. So the British, it seems, had been just as savage as the Mau Mau. How many secrets did our British friend hide? And how much did my parents know? And whose side were we on? Many African leaders in the fight for freedom were also close family friends. Tom Mboya was a rising star who received support from the British Labour Party and led the nationalist fight against British rule. He may also have been a CIA operative. He was a socialist, just like my father, and often came to our house for meals and long talks behind closed doors in Papa's study. Tom Maboya of Kenya. A human struggle. The struggle in Africa is one for nothing less and nothing more than the eradication of poverty, disease, and ignorance. And in this context, you and ourselves are all engaged in the same struggle that can aptly be summarized in terms of a struggle for political freedom, for economic opportunity, and for human dignity. Weren't these my parents' values? They spent every day fighting poverty, disease, and ignorance. 
They knew all about the struggle for freedom and supported the Mau Mau rebellion in principle, if not its brutal methods. They didn't seem to see the destruction of civilization in Kenya. It's 1959, the height of the Cold War, the height of the anti-colonial movement in East Africa, the beginning of the civil rights movement in this country, and a year later, a young man from Hyannis would run for president. With Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, Harry Belafonte, Sidney Poitier, Jackie Robinson, and others, Mboya founded the famous Kenya Airlift, which brought East African students, including Barack Obama Sr., to American universities for training as the future leaders of the independent nation. Mboya's foresight helped Kennedy to lure African leadership away from Moscow and to win the black vote in the 1960 election. In 1959, Mboya was only 29, Pa was 52, yet they shared common views about the need for educated Africans to take leadership roles after independence. Could it be that this was what they had discussed in Pa's office at home? In Nairobi, Father, he was a highly visible person, beholden to the government for his job, he sort of cast his lot ideologically with Mboya. That took a certain amount of courage. It got Mboya killed. Another dear friend of Pa's was Bruce Mackenzie, the Minister of Agriculture and a British spy. In 1976, he helped to broker the release of Israeli hostages held at Entebbe by Palestinian and German terrorists. 1963, John F. Kennedy assassinated. 1968, Martin Luther King assassinated. 1977, Bruce McKenzie assassinated. 1969, Tom Mboya assassinated. My father wept, not just for the loss of his friends, but for the loss of the great vision for Kenya that they had all shared. What role had he played, if any, in the political events surrounding these friends and colleagues? How had my parents, Jewish refugees, socialists, woven their way through the intrigue and political tension that threatened to split Kenya apart during the 1950s? Was their allegiance really with Her Majesty the Queen? Or with the emerging leaders of the new republic? Who were we? in this Kenya that bubbled and boiled around us. As a teenager growing up in Nairobi, I had stopped believing that I was English and was aware of being Jewish. But mostly, I thought of myself as being Kenyan until I started questioning that idea from its very roots. Our house was surrounded by Mama's world-famous cactus garden and creepers that grew over the windows. Every inch of wall was covered with carvings and masks, images of other people's ancestors, but we had none of our own. I always considered the old man outside. He's my grandfather. He looks ahead, but he also looks behind. He smiles, but he's also sad. He's full of thoughts. His head is empty. He can't remember, but I feel, you know, his family. And we had Granny Emma, who had survived the war and came all the way from Bucharest to live next door in Nairobi. I was embarrassed whenever Ma rang the bell to summon the servants. They knew everything about us, but I knew only their first names, never more details. As a child, they were my only real contact with Africans, invisible yet all present. Only years later did I start asking questions. Why did they work for Mzungus, white people? 
Had they ever considered a different life? Did they even have such options? My name is Franz Simwangi, and I'm 53 years old. I come from Nakuru, and I'm Kikuyu by the tribe. I have been working with Mrs. Men for 23 years now. I work for my living. I have to work to, to get money, to live. But also I should tell you, Oscar, I like working with Mzungos because they have been good to me since I started working for Mzungos. And then you fry it in deep fat. Nairobi was, um, in a way, a, a corner of paradise. It was a beautiful, elegant city with wide avenues, uh, coloured with bougainvillea, very smart, modern buildings, and had an extraordinary, sophisticated feel about it. I remember going to the Stanley Hotel and thinking that I was part of the international jet set, which I suppose to some extent we were because it was the destination at the time. Like your family, they had a lot of different Indian friends and uh, African friends. Our lives were jam-packed with safari camping trips, parties, costume balls. We have every night a reception, every night a party. We were saturated in British, European, Indian and African culture. I attended all-white schools in Nairobi. At the Kenya Girls High School, one of the best in Africa, we students belonged to houses named after famous British colonialists like Lord Delamere. We wore British uniforms, obeyed very tough rules, and followed a British syllabus in which the six wives of Henry VIII were memorized, while African history was simply ignored. When I was 16, I had an enormous amount of fun exploring the city. My memories of Nairobi uh, were that of a blissful city. From our house, I drove down Delamere Avenue and down to the town centre. On the way, I might drop in to the old Tours Hotel, where Granny Emma baked her famous cakes at the Café Vienna, where other European exiles came for a fleeting taste of home. Nairobi in the 60s was absolutely stunning. Greenery, wonderful trees, colour, jacarandas. It was spectacular. On Saturday mornings, I met friends at the New Stanley Hotel's world-famous Thorn Tree Cafe. You could pin a note for anyone in the world on the acacia tree. Legend had it that they would eventually find it. And the long bar at the Stanley, the hunters would come and there'd be the long hunting cars outside of the New Stanley and you'd meet there and laugh and joke. I often did homework at the Macmillan Memorial Library. Sometimes we had lunch at the Norfolk Hotel, established in 1904, a bastion of Kenya's colonial period. In the evenings, we saw the latest international movie releases at the Kenya cinema of the 20th century. I was involved in many amateur theatre productions and loved the Donovan Mall Theatre, which imported professional actors from London. There was even a synagogue in town, but our family never attended, except for Granny Emma. Papa had absolutely forbidden her to take us with her. Thus, being Jewish was simply not a factor in our lives. Mm -hmm. 
Basically what it was, it was very much a sort of white European English settler society. You didn't mix with Africans. I began to see that I lived in an artificial bubble. I wandered the Asian sections and found mosques and entire residential areas that I had driven through before but never really seen. I rode up to Mathega, where only the wealthiest whites could afford to live. All I could see were walls and gardens, a far cry from the African areas that were rapidly becoming the largest slums in the world. And we whites were hugely outnumbered. Was I really a Kenyan? That question began to loom large in my mind. On the surface, Nairobi was paradise for whites. We had suppressed and survived the Mau Mau. But there was growing tension as we rumbled towards independence. Our gardener told me that after the big day, he would own my car. Violence and chaos in the Congo. Barely 11 days after official independence from Belgium, Congolese troops mutiny and began a wave of attacks and looting throughout the far-flung sectors of the former colony. Fearing a similar bloodbath, white Kenyans packed up and fled. And by the time the big day arrived on December 12, 1963, I was 17 and every single one of my friends had left the country. At the Uhuru Stadium, the articles of independence were handed by the Duke to the country's Prime Minister. At midnight, the British flag came down and the Kenya flag was raised and the proud new national anthem played for the first time. Was I now a real Kenyan? I didn't know and I felt as though I had just been catapulted into a great vacuum. It seemed I had no future in Kenya at all, and I decided that as soon as I graduated from college, I would leave. And a few years later, I too packed up and left my beloved Kenya behind. At home, a strange brick was embedded in the wall of past study, as a child, I traced my fingers over its pitted surface. Pa said that they had returned to Europe after the war and taken the brick from Hitler's house. But he didn't explain who Hitler was. A family friend, maybe? Pa's collection of old postcards from Przemysl, where he was born in 1907, shows a lovely, thriving town on the southwestern border between Poland and the Ukraine. It lies in the valley of the San River and stretches lazily over nearby hills. Przemysl was first noted in the 11th century as an important Jewish trading post. By the time Pa was born in 1907, the town was home to over 18,000 Jews, almost half its population. They participated in local government, ran many newspapers and cultural institutions, and manufactured everything from candles to bullets. Pa's father managed a brick-making factory, but anti-Semitism rose steadily. And perhaps that's why Pa's birth was never officially registered. When Pa was only seven, World War I broke out and his town was besieged. When he was ten, a Cossack galloped down his street and threw him a round bundle. A cabbage for dinner, Pa thought, but it turned out to be a human head. As a college student, he was an ardent communist and got himself expelled from school and from Poland. 
he studied veterinary science in Czechoslovakia and returned to Poland to start his own clinic. Soon after his 32nd birthday, on September 15, 1939, Hitler's armies marched into town. Three days later, the first mass executions of Jews took place. And three years later, the Gestapo would confine Jews, including all of Pa's relatives, to a walled ghetto. All but his niece would be exterminated. But by September 21st, 1939, Pa had said goodbye to his relatives, hastily shot all his animal patients, slung his one pair of shoes over his shoulder, and walked barefoot out of Poland forever. By September 28th, Pa was registered in Bucharest as a refugee, where the lovely Erika Schoenbaum was a student of architecture and a political activist herself. They met, they fell in love. Pa was a famous vet and soon opened a veterinary clinic. Both Erika and Igor were an enigmatic couple, complicated, well-educated, multilingual, and very energetic. Surely, they thought, Hitler would not come so far east. But they were wrong. At age 87, we have brought Mama to Romania for the first time since the war. We're on our way to Radauts, way up in the north near the Ukrainian border, the town where Granny Emma grew up. In 1930, about 6,000 Jews lived in Radauts. But by 1942, we hear that there were only 42. This is Leia, my great-grandmother. We are descended on her side from the Baal Shem Tov, the mystic founder of Hasidic Judaism. This is Salomon Yograu, Leia's husband. His Hasidic family established their own shul, but our long history of Orthodox Judaism has entirely faded away with time, leaving no imprint at all. Salomon had married five times and had 18 children, and we should have had a vast network of uncles, aunts, and cousins. But we don't. One of Salomon's daughters was Granny Emma, and her only child was my mother, Erica.
This is the main temple in town, where the Yugras worshipped. Hardly anyone uses it now, but I can feel Granny's presence here. Ach, Ikili, she says, using my nickname. So, you have come to the synagogue at last. I remember green velvet furniture in the sitting room with sort of lace, empty macassars and silver candlesticks and the smell of wax and dust. Her memories pulse in my brain. The uncle who taught her to pole vault, her grandfather's shop where she was allowed to pick out dress fabrics, her aunt's wig falling into the soup, the 18 relatives lost in the Struma, a refugee ship torpedoed in the Black Sea. When the concentration camps were going on and the bodies were boiled down to fat and made into soap and salt, the Jewish communities bought up all the soaps that they could find and they're buried here in this one tomb. Jacob, that's, Jacob. that's the one that was yes and Rosa you know, that's right. and he died in 33 in the middle of her two year growth. For me, there are so many graves, so many questions, so many ancestors whispering, beckoning. But when I asked Mama how she felt on the day they fled, she said that she felt free, completely and entirely free. Well, this is the Danube. Somewhere near this point, we left Romania and crossed into Bulgaria, which is just across the river there. But we crossed it in the evening in a small fishing boat. It was October 16th, 1940. They didn't know it then, but thus began their great odyssey to Africa. It was not merely an escape, but a great adventure, and in the end, a long dreamed of destiny. The escape took them overland to Istanbul. British assistance took them by ship to Palestine, where they spent a year in refugee camps. In 1941, they were taken to northern Rhodesia by troop ship, where the British had offered Pa a job as a veterinary officer in a remote outpost called Fort Jameson. Then, in June 1942, Pa accepted the position as meat inspector at Liebig's Meat Factory in Kenya the start of his dramatic rise to worldwide fame in his field. Pa understood sustainability and human ecology long before they became catch words. He traveled all over Kenya with his mobile educational units, exposing nomads and villagers to new ideas on everything from beekeeping to leather tanning, tick-borne diseases and nutrition. He rejected his Jewish roots and any form of spirituality and instead developed a profound understanding and respect for the African way of life. He became an international consultant and badgered foreign donors to finance his Animal Health and Industry Training Institute in Nairobi and spread his policies on animal husbandry all over the world. Guyana, as you know, is bloody, moist and hot. The task was try to cement 19 Caribbean countries which hate each other and establish an Ahiti that required diplomacy, skill, tact, knowledge, brutality, 
Who knows what? And I succeeded. And often he reminded me that we were not his only children, meaning that he cared as much for all the world's children as for his own and was a brilliant fundraiser for freedom from hunger. After his death, Ma chaired the charity's sponsored walks. Whether you plant a tree, whether you put a rock in the way of a stream that goes down a hill, no matter what you do, that helps the environment and helps the country, helps in the fight against hunger and poverty. And with that, I say once again, Kwaheria Kona na Labda na Santi Sam. This to encourage you to continue helping us in our fight for hunger. In one of his projects, my father tried to encourage herbalists to share their secret knowledge publicly. In Bungoma, a little town near Lake Victoria, he established a school for herbal medicine, and after his death, Ma continued the work. The only drop of milk in the Kenya coffee, as she liked to say. I did a push from a nice young man. No, uh, on my bottom, sweetie. Okay. No, no, not my hand. Okay, one, two, three. Oops, that's it. It was very nice and well done. Gentle push, I'm sure. My parents are powerful catalysts for change in Africa, breaking long-standing traditions for the good of the people. But despite colonial echoes to their work, the great white master hands down his superior wisdom. No one here seems to care. The job gets done, that's all. Hello, Mama. Hello to you. It's a pleasure very to nice see you to again. See you. This is an occasion that I would not miss. Thank you so but much for coming. You Thank here. you for coming. Wow, and you read it. I did the first planning of Bungoma when I was a physical planning officer for the Kenya government way back in 56, 57, something like that. I was not born. Oh, that's all right. She made sure that the African mentality especially, that one of concealing, a medicine man concealing his knowledge of medicine to, her, to himself should be crushed. And we are crushing it by exchanging, the thought of us, exchanging knowledge. We expect this gentleman and other members of the Herbalist Association to teach and train other people in this very ancient science. It's not a craft, it's not witchcraft, it is a science. The old thing is a science. And unfortunately, with every old person that dies, a lot of knowledge dies also. And therefore, we want this to be continued. We want them to work together with other herbalists from other parts of Kenya. Challenge us from time to time to be gender sensitive. He also challenged us to be mindful of mixing the ages that we should involve young people so that we hand them, we hand our knowledge to them so that in the end many more people are able to plant, produce trees and consume them. It's awesome. My parents built a way of life in Africa that perfectly matched their belief system as socialists and Jews and gave them a new identity. But we, their children, are neither socialists nor Jews but have added layers to that multicolored cloak. Now we're called white Africans. What that means and who we really are, 
remains an enigma for each of us. My brother Oscar spends a great deal of time among the Maasai, collecting their artifacts and studying their healing rituals. A seriously hot walk, but we've made it back down without any twisted or broken ankles, no snakes, no anything. Most of my friends are Maasai and African. Yeah. And I f also feel rooted here, but that's mm. different from having roots. But I don't have any cultural identity or ethnic roots or, or yeah. ancestral roots. I don't. <laughs> It tastes like aloe, it's sort of bitter, now bitter sweet. And now I guess we just wait. I mean, that would certainly make anybody sick, I think. <laughs> Talk about other healing, uh, maybe. Yeah. But let us do that separately. You know, I don't want that to be conditioned. Yeah. I just Are you able to tell him that? Yeah, I'm able to. So tell please him. tell him that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's certainly lightening up, <laughs> but that just m might mean that the, oh, I don't know what it means, but anyway, the atmosphere is a bit lighter than it was. Okay. a Jewish community in Nairobi and a synagogue and granny made a point of going. I think it was then that I first really began to feel that I might possibly be Jewish after all and by the time I was 14 or 15 I was interested in going with her until Papa absolutely hit the roof and announced that no child of his was allowed to absorb any religion and particularly not the Jewish one. My sister Rodia shares the spiritual beliefs of the Samburu people of northern Kenya. She's also absorbed the mystic teachings of the Kabbalah. I know I have reincarnated and I'm one of these people who is a bit of a mystic and a dreamer and in my dreams I have seen past lives. One of my closest and dearest friends is in fact a spiritual leader of the Borana people. He's a refugee from Ethiopia here. He has a sacred site on the outskirts of Nairobi. He was guided here by the star Sirius. He actually has declared me a reincarnated elder of the tribe. I'm just going to pour a little milk onto the ground here at the bus's holy tree to feed it spiritually. It needs a bit of spiritual okay. Right in here. Okay. When I stand in this place, I am not Rhodia. 
My name is Adaweche. Eh, ishini le se na toko kabdi wa ada wara raga kana varatte turte hati wech emo se na gada ke sati. Ragdu be kam tu ragdu varto ta ke sta wa raga kana koratte makashi rodia miti ason nufu ani hada wech ragdu oromo saniyet. Hatiweche died 200 years ago. Hatiweche suni mo sena raga ke sati on koradu. Wagadi balaman dura du tejet. She said she would return. Shini zaka yet the devi etan amaleka yet tejet. She said her skin would be white. She said she would teach again. I heard the story of Hadaweche as it is taught in oral tradition. I had remembered my Hadaweche life completely. The legend, the story that you all teach orally, has a few small mistakes in it. The biggest mistake was that I did not end up a rich woman. And I've written my story in English because that is my language this time. All I wanted was to make sure that somebody had the true story so that the oral history can change and be a bit more accurate. This is the tree of truth. I wanted the truth to be known. This is the story of Hawecha. The Vasa Hindi Kichabu Yangu story of Hawecha. Am I Jewish? That's a very difficult question to answer. Having studied so many African cultures, I do feel more at home with their religion and their spiritual beliefs. So, no, I don't feel very Jewish. And by the way, I have never been Jewish before. Like my brother and sister, I have never felt Jewish, yet those roots cling ever deeper to the bedrock of my soul. Where does true identity live in this age of global internet alliances? And how have our children found answers to these questions? This is Zora, my brother's daughter, who lives in Berlin. And I don't really identify with one place or one culture. I don't really feel like I belong anywhere. I lived for half my life in France, and I think culturally I'm probably mostly French. I don't feel like I belong anywhere. I've always felt like a foreigner, because I'm even more removed from roots than you are, because I grew up traveling as a kid, and you always had this African connection. Being an artist and making art definitely has to do, for me, with a search for identity. It's a way of saying something on that subject without having to pin it down. Or to be precise, you can have a lot of paradoxes in a painting, say things at the same time. And that, to me, has something to do with my condition of not having roots and having a mixed identity. Some of my paintings are definitely inspired by the few years I spent in Africa. But they aren't only inspired from my personal experience, but from an importance that I believe that the continent has in globalization. This is my daughter, Sophie, who is an actress in Los Angeles. The legend goes that our family um, in its ancestry, there is the Baal Shem Tov. If the legend is correct, that would be my great, 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 great grandfather. And he was the founder of his citizen. My aunt had said that she felt connected to this guy because of her somewhat mystical inclinations. And I c couldn't help but feel the same. 
I feel like I'm an old soul. I have wisdom, but my wisdom is within the newness of my mind. I feel like I'm a new breed. For example, when I'm painting or when I'm alone a lot or when I'm kind of meditating on being in the moment, I can sense whether it's that there's another sense inside me or that I am a person that can sense another like space that I have yet to be able to define in this world. The pictures I have mostly of my grandfather in my mind are in Africa. They're not like of in Poland. So to me, he's a leathery man that was a veterinarian that worked for cattle and liked the Maasai tribesmen. He, of course, his soul is African. When Pa died, aged 82, his memorial was held at the Animal Health and Industry Training Institute that he founded in Nairobi, and that became a model all over the world. Iko will remain a living legend in our memories. He initiated beekeeping and wax production under the office of the ministry. He began innumerable animal husbandry projects. He started rural milk plants. He began the Dairy Technology Institute at Edison College. He even went to Uganda and operated and advised them on hippo control and the turning of the hippo meat into protein feed. And lastly, he created a mobile bone meal factory. I think he demonstrated enormously the value dedicated refugee, that if that is a man who is willing to serve Africa and not take from it, is always welcome. I've decided to bury our brother in a truly African heroic way, because those words which were used in the past, the song that was just passed, are only used when you are burying an African hero. <laughs> Pa says that because he came to Kenya with no money, no religion, and no racial divides, he was able to befriend the African. Out of greatest respect, they call him Mze, or wise old man. In 1966, things came full circle for Pa. At Buckingham Palace, he received a medal as a member of the British Empire awarded by Queen Elizabeth II for service to God and the Empire. And in 1969, he was also honored by his old university in Brno, Czechoslovakia, for outstanding achievements in the field of veterinary medicine. At last, his many lives seemed to be reconciled as one, except for the imaginary place he called man's paradise that he documented in his annual letters to friends and colleagues all over the world. Here, he escaped the madness of Western development and global environmental disaster. A land, he wrote, where man is still in balance with nature, where an extended family and clannish loyalty are better than a bank account. In the end, Pa lost his paradise in a sea of sand, victim of mismanagement and environmental catastrophe. He said that the old Africa, his beloved Africa, had been corrupted by the West and was dead. We spread Pa's ashes over his Africa. At that very moment, after months of drought, the heavens exploded with a mighty rainstorm and I heard Pa's voice for the last time. This is the old bastard baboon. I see the biological necessity for my finish, but I do not see any logic in it. I am more experience, maybe I am uh, more knowledgeable, I am more tolerant, but still I don't see the reason why I should Pa never developed any relationship to Judaism. But in her old age, Mama seemed to come full circle. Uh, I've reverted, if you like, to my Jewishness not so very long ago. 
and mainly because I want to belong to a community and I don't belong to anything else. I go to the synagogue twice a year, once for the remembrance of the dead, when I like to listen to the Kol Nidre and think of the people in my family who have gone. For the last 31 years, I've been with Mrs. Mann. All this time, I had a wonderful time. All the freedom that I needed, it was there. We were so happy, I and my family. I'm very, very happy to see my promise came true. We were like married. You know, when people married, they always say, only the death will separate. Now we are separated by the death, and this is the promise I had given to her. Just as we had done with Pa, we sent Ma back to her mother earth at the Hindu crematorium in Nairobi. I'm told that if one has obeyed Jewish laws well, one's Jewish soul will go to the world to come, where it will rejoice in godly bliss. So I suspect that my parents' souls have found their own world to come and are hovering somewhere over Kenya, their very own promised land, ever watchful over the poor and hungry. And that's where I hope to go, too. Because my Africa is not dead. It is my friend and mentor, no matter where I live or what papers I carry. It's as though in my sleep I was sent to paradise where someone gave me a beautiful flower. And when I awoke, the flower was still in my hand. And it's enough. <laughs>